Good morning, First Unitarian. We are continuing our series on courage this morning. Last week we talked about intellectual courage. This morning we're going to talk about moral courage. And in weeks to come, we will be looking at physical courage and social courage, spiritual courage, and maybe a few others besides that. So a fine definition for moral courage is doing the right thing, even at the risk of inconvenience or social embarrassment or getting it wrong, even doing the right thing, even when um, what we might be feeling is apathy or complacency or fear or cynicism or comfortable right where we are. Moral courage is about listening to our conscience, which is a very important word to our Unitarian and Universalist ancestors. Moral courage is what James Baldwin was talking about when he said, not everything uh, that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So to get where I'm going, I want to tell you a short true story about First Unitarian Denver. One of last year's initiatives at our congregation was to revisit our congregational covenant. A covenant, you will remember, is a living statement of our mutual aspirations for how we will be together. The values and behavior to which we choose to be lovingly and mutually accountable. We are a covenantal faith tradition, and our covenants are relational and they are communal. So the Board of Trustees, recognizing all of that, created a team, a task force, to ask the congregation what should be in our new covenant. And the task force created surveys and online and in-person and opportunities to fill out post-it notes and hosted discussion groups and made themselves available on Sunday morning. And we had a Sunday service in February where we sought feedback and asked people to answer questions and we collected all that information. And uh, the final report of the Covenant Task Force uh, is in the Plowshare newsletter this month, by the way, which is accessible on the church's website. And I'm going to share a small portion of that final report right here. They wrote in that report, comments came in from our youth, from young adults, longtime members, newcomers, people of color, LGBTQ members, musicians, people with disabilities, those who are in sanctuary with us, and others. It was moving and gratifying that so many people would share their thoughts on such a personal topic. There were many sentiments about being included, acknowledged, safe, about making space. A specific request was made by our People of Color Caucus through thoughtful and honest dialogue to include language around oppression and specifically white supremacy culture in the covenant. The covenant committee members read all of these hundreds of data points and identified the most commonly words used for phrases and themes. The first draft of the covenant was shared back to the congregation through the plowshare on social media, through outreach to congregational committees and groups. And uh, about a dozen emails with feedback were received. Some people liked it just as it was. Some people suggested some tweaks to language. Some people questioned if white supremacy culture were the right words or if covenant were the right place to speak those words. Emails from the Racial Justice Project gave strong support to the language. And here uh, I'm going to read now and show you the final draft of the covenant statement, the proposed covenant statement, as it was unanimously approved by the Board of Trustees. These are Turns out the exact words I used in the pastoral prayer this morning. I will listen to you. I will make space for you. I will include you. Together we will be a community of love, respect, and justice. Together we will learn about white supremacy culture to create an equitable congregation. Together we will protect the vulnerable. When we fall out of covenant, we will call each other back in. That is the language that will be submitted to you, the congregation, for a vote this fall 
uh, in hopes that you will adopt it. And I want to take a moment to reflect on white supremacy culture and why the task force and the Board of Trustees and the Racial Justice Project and our People of Color Caucus and myself feel strongly that these words need to be in our covenant. And we recognize that many people find these to be difficult words. They're difficult to write, difficult to read, even difficult to say. And it's important that we have a common understanding of what is meant by that phrase and what's intended by that phrase. That's what I want to talk about right now. When we say white supremacy culture, we are referring to the common cultural assumptions, cultural expectations, cultural associations. The hundreds of unspoken, unwritten, but intimately familiar ways that culturally exclude, punish, ignore, silence, or otherwise disenfranchise non-white human beings. To go with the iceberg analogy that Aaron demonstrated earlier, we're talking about those deep-seated ways of seeing or of not seeing, of speaking or of not speaking, of denying or of not denying, of pretending or not pretending, so internalized that it's done even without the realization that it's been done. All those parts of the iceberg that are uh, under the surface, which is the majority of the iceberg. These habits are so culturally normative that even bringing them up sometimes often makes white people very uncomfortable and sometimes makes white people very, very angry. As if civilization itself were somehow under attack or being called into question, which is, of course, a false dichotomy. Turns out there's lots of wonderful literature out there about how to recognize white supremacy culture, and I'm going to share just a few common, often unspoken characteristics. White supremacy culture tends to focus on results over and above relationship. I've done that a thousand times. I know I have. And so has our congregation. And we often get results. But we also often leave people out. The focus on results over relationship, pragmatically and culturally, leaves people out. Defensiveness is a characteristic of white supremacy culture. White people tend to get defensive, seeing any critique or correction as a personal attack instead of an invitation to a more honest relationship. But that's only the beginning. Whole organizations, committees, cliques, families, and social systems are, end up being set up to protect and defend the way we've always done it or some cultural norm, which almost always means the way that some white man set it up to work. And big surprise, almost always favors white men. Defensiveness has the effect of making it difficult or just even socially costly to raise different ideas. Again, having the effect of leaving people and their ideas out. Defensiveness is related to power hoarding, a cultural assumption, and it is cultural, that power is a limited resource. And that leads towards people who have power don't tend to see it or see the value in sharing it and feel threatened by suggestions for changing it and take suggestions for organizational change as a personal attack on their leadership. I'm pretty sure I've done that, actually, a time or two, probably without even being aware of it, or at least not being willing to be aware of it. Paternalism is a characteristic of white supremacy culture, where decision-making is absolutely clear to those who have power and absolutely unclear to people who don't have power where those in power just assume that they are capable and entitled to make decisions for those who don't have power and assume that it's not important or even necessary to check in with 
or to understand the viewpoint or the experience of those who are being affected. Paternalism happens to women in white supremacy culture a lot, and I would bet every single woman listening to this could give you dozens of examples when they have experienced paternalism. Individualism. Another assumption of white supremacy culture. This one's really sneaky, but it's individualism turns out to be just great for people who have power and privilege, right? For people who look, sound, and act something like the white cultural ideal. But it also functions very effectively as a cop-out for not addressing the systemic, procedural, cultural structures that prevent Millions from being included, empowered, or even accepted. I could go on and on. We're only scratching the surface of white supremacy culture and what it is and how it works. I could go on and on, but I'm going to specifically mention just one more. White supremacy culture assumes a right to social comfort. And as many modern writers have noticed, white people in general have a pretty low tolerance for social discomfort. This is often referred to as white fragility. And there's a wonderful popular book with exactly that title by the educator Robin DiAngelo. White fragility is demonstrated when white people get defensive or assume the privilege, and it is a privilege, that white people have, of avoiding or just checking out of any real talk about relationship or about honesty or anything that explicitly challenges any of the norms, habits, and assumptions that I've been talking about. By now... You've probably, uh, you've probably realized why I'm bringing all this stuff up about white supremacy culture in a sermon that's really about moral courage. We're talking about doing the right thing. Even when it feels risky, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's inconvenient, I'm suggesting, my dear friends, That there's a reason our congregation has remained so stubbornly and overwhelmingly white for all of its 149 years of existence. And it has a lot to do with what what I'm talking about with white supremacy culture. Dr. Nita Mosby-Tyler, a nationally known educator and consultant on racial matters, educated me. A couple of months ago at Shorter AME Church, a workshop I was at, when she asked me if our congregation valued diversity, I said, of course it does. It's written right into our vision statement. She said, "Uh uh-huh. Yeah, you don't really value diversity. And I know that, she said, because diversity is the wrong word. Diversity is a false flag. It's a tower without foundation. The world, she said, it's already, the world's already diverse. Diversity is the order of things. Diversity is a given. If you really want to be a more diverse community, stop talking about diversity and start talking about inclusion. Hmm. Stop talking about diversity and start talking about equity. Stop talking about diversity and start asking what systems, what social conditions have been put in place or are in place, that perpetually maintain certain groups in the majority and perpetually leave other groups out. Start asking, who's, at the ta- who's not at the table when you're making decisions? Start asking, whose voices are just sort of quietly ignored or or systematically or habitually passed over? Who, who looks around your space? and doesn't see themselves represented. How many people of color are out there who are starving for community, who are dying to be accepted, included, and loved for who they are, but they're just too tired 
to fight through the defensiveness and the paternalism and the either or thinking and the power hoarding and the individualism that is built into the emotional system of your church. I'm paraphrasing what Dr. Mosby Tyler said there, but that is precisely what she was getting at. And she's right. And that's why we're having this conversation. And that's why our covenant needs to be aspirational and a little challenging and ruthlessly honest. I'm not trying to beat us up. I'm not trying to beat us up. I love us. I love you. I love everything we stand for. And it's important to be truthful in loving relationships. I want us to have the moral courage to do the right thing. I want us to have the moral courage to learn about and engage white supremacy culture so that we can be a more truly inclusive, loving, honest community. Because not everything faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. This fall, you're going to be asked to vote on that congregation covenantal statement, and I hope you'll vote yes, and I hope you'll do it enthusiastically. In the meantime, I will listen to you. I will make space for you. I will include you. Together, we will be a community of love, respect, and justice. Together, we will learn about white supremacy culture to create an equitable congregation. Together, we will protect the vulnerable. When we fall out of covenant, we will call each other back in. Amen.